This is lesson 3.3, and we'll talk about continuous probability distributions here. So earlier in the class, we talked about the difference between discrete data versus continuous data. And the reason for that was essentially this talk right here, so that you can understand the reasons why we make a difference between uh, discrete random variables and continuous random variables. So a continuous random variable is one such that there is an uncountably infinite number of possible outcomes. All right, so for instance, consider the experiment of measuring how long it takes a runner to complete a 100 meter dash. So we might only be able to accurately measure that time to the nearest tenth of a second, perhaps. And we may find that some runner completed a race in 12.2 seconds. But it's not really likely that the runner actually completed the race in exactly 12.2 seconds. It's probably more likely somewhere between 12.1 and 12.3 seconds. And we've simply rounded that value off to the convenient value of 12.2. But it's entirely possible that the runner actually completed the race in something like 12.215618711 seconds, for instance. With a discrete random variable, it made sense to create a list of all the possible outcomes and pair those with the associate probability. But in the case with a continuous random variable, because there's an infinitely many number of possible values between any two numbers, we can't make that list. We can't just write a list of all possible outcomes. And even if we could, it's really unlikely that any of our runners would actually finish the race with some specific time, like 12.215 and the likelihood of any particular outcome occurring would end up just being zero. So for this reason, because we can't list all the potential outcomes of a continuous random variable, we have a mathematical function which depicts a, a curve. Like in an algebra class, if you graphed x squared, for instance, it came up with a mathematical curve. So we have a curve that represents a continuous random variable. But with that, we're actually also going to need a different way of thinking about probability, but one, but a way of thinking about probability that still coincides with the discrete case. So if we consider the histogram of a discrete probability distribution, one thing that we mentioned but didn't really explain was that you can use the area of a histogram bar to define the value of a probability instead of just the height of the bar. And this is because the bar was restricted to unit width since the bars had to touch. And if we think of area as defining probability in a discrete random variable, then we can actually do the same for a continuous random variable. Let me show you a demonstration to help you understand what it is I'm trying to convey. So looking at a discrete random variable, and I'm going to use a binomial distribution here because we're somewhat familiar with those. If we think of the height of these histogram bars representing probabilities in a binomial distribution, it does work out. Like for instance, the height of the bar in this particular case, I've got 15 trials, the probability of success is 0.65, and the outcome 9, uh, the height of that bar is just slightly under 0.2, and you can see over here uh, the actual height is 0 0.1906. So the height of the bar does represent the probability. But if we try and take that sort of thinking over to the continuous case, and I'll use a bell curve for a continuous distribution because uh, we're somewhat familiar with those. The thing is, the continuous random variable is represented by a mathematical curve. So you can see that curve here. 
And every single point along the x-axis has a height associated with it. So the thing is, if I chose some point, whatever the height of the curve is, if that's supposed to be the probability associated with that particular outcome, the thing is, the one right next to it has a very similar height. The one right next to that has a very similar height. And as we add all of those up together, we're going to end up with uh, something greater than one. Okay, uh, we're always it would be infinity to uh, be precise. So that's a problem because the sum of all of our probabilities in any distribution is supposed to be equal to one. So using the individual outcomes as heights representing the probability values. It's not going to work in the continuous case. But if we think of using area instead, this works pretty well because the width of each of these histogram bars in the discrete case is one. So like for instance, this particular bar reaches over to 8.5 and over to 9.5. So the width of this bar is one. The height is still 0 0.1906, and therefore the area is 0 0.1906 times 1. So we restrict the width to be 1, so that the area is just technically equal to the height, but we can then think of area representing the probability. And in the continuous case, we can use this concept of area similarly. So we can actually define mathematically what the area underneath a, a mathematical curve is uh, between any two values uh, below that curve. So if we, calc if we define probability as area under the curve, then uh, we have a way of similarly defining probability in the continuous case and in the discrete case. And the other advantage that occurs by doing that is that we know that the total area of the uh, discrete case, if we add up all the probabilities in the discrete case, the total of all or the sum of all the probabilities is equal to one. So if we're thinking of this as area, then it also makes sense that the total area underneath a continuous curve is going to also be equal to 1. So we get the property that the sum of the probability in a continuous distribution is also equal to 1. So let's start listing out some properties of continuous probability distributions. So the main thing is that for any continuous probability dis, uh, distribution function, and it's represented by a curve, the probability between any two values uh, along an axis, which in this case we'll just say the x-axis for simplicity, is the total area under the curve. So the amount of area under the curve between the values a and b defines the probability of a continuous random variable. So what that looks like is that the area of this shaded region right here is equal to uh, the probability of the random variable between those values a and b. So all we have to do is find the area of that. Now, Often that's a pretty difficult computation to come up with, so don't worry. Technology generally jumps in there and handles that part for us, but we just need to understand where the value is coming from. All right, the next property is that the total area under the curve of a probability distribution function uh, is going to be equal to 1, just like we talked about. 
the probability of any single outcome is equal to zero. So if we want the probability of just one specific value, that's equal to zero. And let, let me demonstrate why that is. So if I have one value on this range, that's just, I'll call it x, all right? And I want the area between x and itself. Well, between x and itself, there's just that one line, there's just that sliver, and there's no area between it. So the total area between um, a value and itself is just equal to zero. So the probability is equal to zero. So that's a principle that we have of continuous random variables. The inclusion and exclusion of endpoints, uh, because this probability of a single outcome is zero, the inclusion and exclusion of endpoints does not affect the area of the shaded region. So uh, it doesn't matter if you're answering a question uh, that asks for what's the probability of a random variable between two values, including the endpoints, or if one of the endpoints is excluded, or if they're both excluded. Because the probability of each endpoint itself is equal to zero, it doesn't matter if you are including these or not. The total area under the curve is still the same. So you don't have to worry about like with the case in binomial distributions uh, at most versus less than. So you're including an endpoint versus not including an endpoint. It doesn't matter in a continuous distribution. Now, when we work with continuous distributions, uh, we generally work with technology to do these computations for us. And there's going to generally be three key functions defined for each kind of uh, distribution that we come across. So first and foremost, there generally is a PDF function uh, which is the probability distribution function defined for each type of distribution we come, come across. This is the function that determines the height of the distribution's curve at a specific input value. They're really important with regard to discrete distributions, but in this class, we don't use them for continuous distributions. The height, the probability at a single output value is zero anyway. Um, the PDF function does give a value, but it doesn't give the area. Uh, it's not an area value. It is the height of the curve. So for instance, if you wanted on your calculator screen to draw a nice bell curve, you could use the function uh, it's normal PDF in your calculator. And it gives you the height of the curve at different x values. So if you just picked, you know, the calculator just kind of picks different x values all the way up to, you know, between, say, like negative 10 and positive 10. And it gives you the height of the curve uh, at any particular point. And you could use those heights, and basically the the calculator uses those points to pretty much play like connect the dots um, in order to draw your curve on screen. Okay, But we don't really have a need for that, so you won't use this function in the class. So anytime you are working with continuous distributions, don't worry about the PDF. You will, however, use the CDF function, which is the cumulative distribution function. The cumulative distribution function, this is the one that calculates the area under a curve. So therefore, it's actually calculating probabilities here for us. This is the one that we want to uh, work with. And most technology, some does it differently, um, but most technology calculates the area under the curve between two input values. So if you have you know, some continuous distribution 
and you have an input value, uh, and usually you need two of them, it will calculate the area between. So like I'm using, I'm picking on a normal distribution. There is a function in your calculator called normal CDF very often, and it calculates the area between two values. Now, not all technology works the same. So like some technology might be left oriented instead of between. So you give it some input value and it provides the total area to the left of that. And so it's probably also going to be labeled normal CDF. So you need to know how your technology works. Is it providing between the area between two values or is it providing the area to the left of some value? Uh, it's pretty uncommon to see the right oriented probabilities, but left and between are both pretty common. And lastly, an inverse function. So very commonly you also have a third function that calculates an inverse. So what happens here is with an inverse function, it accepts a specific area under the curve for a distribution and it returns to you a value that has that particular area under the curve to its left, which might sound a bit confusing right now, and that's okay. We are kind of speaking in the hypothetics right now. Uh, when we start working with specific types of distributions, this will start to all make more sense. But the idea is, um, let's say you want to know uh, like what value has 80% of the distribution uh, under the curve to the left. All right, so you have some value here and it's, uh, it's unknown but we know that it has 80% of the distribution's area to the left of it. So an inverse function, and in fact in the calculator that most of you are using, there's a function called inverse norm. And it's, I'm picking on normal distributions because that's generally the most common uh, continuous distribution that students work with. So what it does is it takes that area of 80% and it returns a value that is associated that has 80% of the normal distributions area to the left of it. So those three functions, those are the ones that you'll get used to and learn how to use um, for different uh, continuous distributions.